I see you're a man of your word. I am many things, Kalal. You couldn't begin to imagine half of them. But for now, I shall take the role of executioner. Superman is always difficult to write because he is the all-powerful superhero. If you don't power him down, he can fight anything. He's so powerful that it's, it's hard to find somebody who can match him. You know, when you've got a guy who can fly and move planets, you've got to come up with a bigger threat. A lot of the classic Superman villains were like, you know, middle-aged guys in suits. He's one of these characters that usually tries to save other people's lives but doesn't fear for his own. So you don't often get the sense that Superman is fighting for his life. He's super strong, he's super fast. It's impossible to really come up with a credible threat for him. So you really have to ratchet up the threat level. You've got to do something cosmic. Darkseid's valuable because it, it, he is physically the, the equal of Superman. Darkseid is one merciless, evil dude. And so when he showed up, you knew this was serious business. When I was a kid, I was kind of ignorant of, uh, you know, comic book history, and, and Jack Kirby, to me, represented, yeah, he's the Marvel guy. He draws all those kind of blocky characters. Every time I'd get a Jack Kirby comic, I'd go, it's kind of cool, but it's really weird. It's like the drawing is really weird. I know anatomy doesn't look like that. I know people don't have square jaws and, you know, weird mouths and big spacey eyes. With Kirby, it was all about trying to capture in a static medium the sense that things were moving and colliding and crashing into each other. There's a lot of violence and tension and crackle in the way that he would handle things. He's not drawing things, you know, big and blocky just to fill up a panel. He's doing it with a sense of purpose because he wants your eye to go right for uh, the dynamics of the scene. I look upon him as the most influential artist of my generation, or the generation before it. I put him up there with, like, Andy Warhol as somebody who changed the culture. When you see Kirby stuff, as a child, you might be worried that this guy was trying to scare you. They had more personality. There, were, there was more of a soap opera going on, more of a character going on. They had great origins. He was really great with huge, expansive ideas. The, the, the whole idea of sort of the, the cosmic story is Kirby's strong point. He created this tremendous mythology, which had to do with two planets. One was good, one was evil. And in order to stop wars from happening between them, they exchanged suns. It was just a tremendous start for um, a whole host of comic book characters. And he saw firsthand when he was growing up what sort of unbridled uh, capitalism could do to ordinary people and how hard it made their lives. And then he went off to war and he fought in Europe and he saw what uh, the Nazis and what fascism did to people's ordinary lives. And so he had a very sort of gut feeling of what this kind of evil was. And he was able to embody this and coalesce it into a character like Darkseid. Using the idea of Darkseid as a dictator is a really good idea because he represents fascism, whereas Superman represents the will of the individual. So he's a great character, and he's a great match for somebody like Superman because in Darkseid you can see sort of what Superman might become if he did not have the restraints and did not have the morality. Kirby's creation of the fourth world really changed the dynamic at the DC Universe. It has parallels to heaven and hell. You've got Apocalypse, which is clearly hell, and then you've got New Genesis, which is clearly heaven. So it has almost like a biblical slant to it. And Darkseid is the ultimate evil. He's the ultimate tempter, the ultimate devil, if you will. Bringing in a character of the scope and the power of Darkseid really sort of raises the ante for Superman and all of the heroes in the DC Universe. They suddenly have something much larger that they need to contend with. You have Orion, who's fathered by both worlds, basically. He's good and he's evil. With the fourth world, there were so many 
elements and ideas and characters connected to it. You had Darkseid with his relationship with the other planet. We had the estranged son. He had the adopted son, Mr. Miracle, ran away from him. He, he was part of a, a large family. He would have these ideas that would just sort of burst off the page. As the people who followed came along, they would look at it and go, wow, that's a great idea. I could do something with this. And so it was sort of like planting seeds. Darkseid was also a new kind of villain because he marshaled all these other forces. And he marshaled all these other characters. And so you could wrap a whole series or several comic book series as it turned out around your unresolved conflict with that character because he wasn't just a character. He represented a planet, an army, uh, a constellation of forces. With the fourth world, it started to turn into something and he just never got to finish it. And I, I think that's sort of disappointing. The first big major dark side show that we did, Apocalypse Now Parts 1 and 2, um, it wasn't until we started making that show that we realized Wow, this is the first time we'd ever had the entire world in peril in our series. Welcome to Apocalypse, Mr. Manheim. You may call me Dark Side. After a, a season and a half or so of Superman, we realized we really needed to up the ante as far as the stories go. I really wanted to bring in Dark Side as a as a threat to Superman, but also with the idea of showing that this is a guy that Superman could become. Everything was opened up, anything could happen. You know, the world was truly in peril. Darkseid would really push Superman to the limits and push be Superman beyond his own code. And what happens when Superman goes there? We were like, wow, yes. Now he can do something with somebody. Now he can go toe to toe with the villain. <laughs> My son. By bringing Darkseid in, we were able to tell more cosmic stories, something that would affect the entire world. The idea that Superman, a character with science fiction roots, created by avid science fiction fans of the 30s and a character from another world, that he should ultimately face off against a, a, a cast of villains who hailed from another world, who represented some kind of outside threat, I think that was a natural, uh, a natural fit. The great thing that's, that's, that's really different about Darkseid as opposed to all the other DC supervillains that we've been using up to that point is that he's, uh, he's an evil god. The challenge for adapting the fourth world characters for animation was what to leave in and what to leave out. The fourth world characters were introduced sort of slowly in the Superman series. We did a whole series with Intergang where there was a sense that there was some higher power going on behind this. And so you had this sense that you were looking at the very iceberg's tip of some massive evil. To introduce that world, I mean, it's such a big, heavy world that you, you sort of take steps getting into it before, it's, before you, you finally pull the curtain and say, this is it. Initially going into Apocalypse, that was the biggest story we had ever done at that point. And in fact, I remember us not being sure if we could pull it off, that this has got too much scale. It's impossible to do all the models we had to do for the animation, the backgrounds, the color. It was just a huge endeavor at that time. We basically just gave it to the audiences in a, in a big block of exposition, you know? I mean, it was literally, you know, it's like, okay, stop. Here's a movie that tells you everything you need to know about the fourth world backstory. But I think we at least did it in a visually kind of interesting way. And it does have this kind of weird biblical epic feel to it. And the music's gorgeous. And we got Barbara Parkins to narrate it as the mother box. One is called New Genesis. Unparalleled in its beauty. It is ruled by the wise and powerful High Father. When you deal with Darkseid, you get to deal maybe with Granny Goodness or Calabac or Kanto or any of those characters. And it helps to know that there is a almost godlike Darkseid behind the scenes supplying some unity and some, some cohesion to, to the story. But the fact is you don't have to go up against the big gray guy every every time out. One of Kirby's gifts was coming up with really, really off-the-wall concepts for characters. And the stuff, when you say the names out loud, you think, oh, that's a joke. 
I loved working with Granny Goodness. Uh, first of all, we had Ed Asner doing the voice, which just cracked me up. <laughs> uh, and yet, it, somehow, it made sense. Oh, you naughty little monkey! Granny will spank you good! Bruce Tim is a great fan of Jack Kirby, and I think wanted to do Turpin of Kirby. I guess Bruce had the idea of saying, let's make it a lot like Jack, and give him that sort of legendary Kirby feistiness. Because Jack himself is very much that kind of character, kind of old school, tough guy, and with a heart of gold. He's this wonderfully unpretentious character who, when the new gods arrive in his town and start messing everything up, says, well, I'll just arrest them. Won't those inner gang bums ever learn Turpin's first law? You play in my backyard, you play by my rules. Unlike the other villains in the Superman series who, you know, wanted to defeat Superman, they wanted to, you know, kill him or drag him down or whatever it was, Darkseid wanted to destroy his soul. How do you show the audience that a character is really, really bad? I mean, you have to, you have to see him do something pretty terrible. At the end of Apocalypse Now, Superman has routed him, and the new gods come as the cavalry to, you know, banish Darkseid, you know, back to his home planet and leave Earth alone. And, you know, as he's leaving, he turns around and just out of spite, just out of pure spite, he kills Turpin in front of Superman. Savor your moment of triumph, Superman. But remember, victory has its price. Ah! Killing Turpin didn't further Darkseid's goals at all. He had already lost. It wasn't like it was going to do anything, but it was just a way to hurt Superman. We, we see that great scene where Superman like loses it, you know, in, in rage, like destroys, you know, Darkseid's, you know, battle tank destroyer thing. And um, it's something that you never, you never saw Superman lose control like that before. The funeral scene afterwards was really interesting because it allowed us to sort of pay tribute to Kirby and all of his creations. Uh, by having a lot of those creations actually there at the funeral paying tribute to him. And so it was very, very moving for us, who Kirby meant so much to us, to be able to sort of pay him back in this way. The idea of killing someone suddenly raises the stakes for the entire series because it says, look, this can happen. If it can happen to a regular, it can happen to anyone. And suddenly the kids or your audience gets a little bit more nervous. They take the Jeopardy more seriously. Goodbye, old friend. I would not go as far to say that the, that the funeral for Turpin represented uh, symbolically our memorial for Kirby. I don't think that entered the picture. It really was just to play out the emotional moment. Every time Superman wins a battle with Darkseid. He always somehow loses as well. Onward! He's the one villain who somehow manages to push Superman's buttons more than anybody else, even more so than his own arch nemesis Lex Luthor. Darkseid leads the fighting to his underlings. He's incredibly powerful, incredibly strong, but he does not want to do it himself. The real power comes in making people sacrifice their lives for him. Uh, Darkseid was such an absolute villain that he needed to be behind the scenes as often as he was out there in front of the cameras. I wanted to put him in the position where he and Superman had to fight, where it was just a battle to the end. When it really comes down to it, you know, no more dancing around, no more pussyfooting. Balls to the wall, you know, just, just smashing each other, silly. Who's going to win the fight? That's for Dan Turpin. Who? Superman wins the fight, physically. Takes Dark Side, takes his ruined body, throws it into the street, frees the people of Apocalypse, and they don't go. Because at that point, Superman realizes he's lost. He's fought on Dark Side's terms. He's become a brawler. He, he's gotten, he's mixed it up one on one with him. He's broken the bonds of slavery, and the people of Apocalypse are so Be beaten that they just pick up Darkseid and they take him back in because to them he is their god. I am many things, kal -El, but here I am God.
think the fourth world raised the stakes a lot. I think that, that it, it deepened the stories because it brought in those familial relationships that really, really weren't there before. It had been a bunch of two-bit crooks and uh, sort of tin aliens from the 50s and things like that. And suddenly it became part of this large tapestry, this epic story that could be spun out in all sorts of different directions. He wasn't just trying to tell kids stories. I mean, he was trying to play off of much bigger themes and talk about much bigger ideas. Mass media as we know it today would be a completely different landscape if there had never been a Jack Kirby. When I look at Darkseid and what that character did for Kirby and what that character brought to comic books, uh, the first thing I notice is that cosmic evil. Darkseid is a world beater. He is somebody who, who deals at a cosmic scale. Anytime Darkseid came up or was introduced into a comic book, it instantly upped the ante for everything that was happening, and nothing was ever going to be the same. 